Hello, everyone. It's Rabbi Akiva Mails, and I hope you're well. I know that Rosh Hashanah is not till Friday night, but I know that the coming day is going to be very, very busy. We're going to all be tied up with various items, important matters that we need to take care of before the Yom Tov. So I wanted to share a Rosh Hashanah, a brief Rosh Hashanah message with you today, and I, I hope this will be something that you might find meaningful. As we all know, this is such a different year, and we're, we're doing our best. We're going to make the best of this Rosh Hashanah. God willing, our tefillos, our prayers will all be meaningful. HaKadosh Baruch will respond to our prayers and will bring us all the Yeshua, bring us the salvation, bring an end to this pandemic that we're all davening for. You know, one of the fascinating items about this pandemic is you read all these reports about how things have swung both ways. Nebuch, so many people's livelihoods have been affected negatively. And, and it's, it's absolutely terrible. It's not just something that we read about in the papers. It's many of the people we know. It could be family members. It could be friends, members of our communities. People have taken a hit. And if we could be there for you, if we can be of assistance in some way, we hope, please let us know. And please let us know through our discretionary fund. If we could do so in a discreet manner, please let us know. There are, please know there are members of our community who are here for you, who want to be able to assist where we're able to. At the same token, we also read these wild stories about how some areas, in some uh, fields, I should say, uh, this pandemic has caused an incredible increase. One of the ones that we keep reading about is Amazon. And it's ironic because uh, Jeff Bezos didn't need anything else to be made any more wealthy, but somehow or another, this pandemic has enriched Amazon to a far greater degree than they had before. I think we've all seen during this time that we've been shopping on Amazon perhaps a lot more than we had in the past. And I want to tell you about something I bought on Amazon this week. I bought Eternity. That's right. I bought some Nitzchias. I bought Eternity on Amazon. You may be wondering, I don't know, what do you look that up under? How do you buy Eternity on Amazon? And that's what I want to tell you. I bought Eternity on Amazon and it came in the way of this scented candle. Let me explain what I mean. We all know that Yom Tov is around the corner. And once Yom Tov begins, while we're allowed to transfer flame, we're not allowed to light fire anew. So what do we do on the second night of Yom Tov when we want to um, light our, our, our Yom Tov candles? So we have a candle that's been left burning, and we'll, we'll transfer that flame. We'll use another candle, light it from there, and bring that over to the Yom Tov candles that need to be lit. That's what we'll do. Okay, well, what candle are we going to leave burning? So for the last number of years, I've always made it a point to go out and get a nice scented candle. I'll usually leave it in the garage someplace nice and safe. Always leave those candles somewhere safe. I'll leave it in the garage with some Hanukkah candles nearby. So Layla will go light one of the Hanukkah candles, bring that over to light her Yom Tov candles, and put that Hanukkah candle down on a candle holder where it will burn itself out and the Yom Tov candles will burn. But meanwhile, we'll have this large scented candle burning safely in the garage, usually in a metal bucket. So... Where do I get these scented candles? I usually found them at Michael's, a craft store right around here. So I went into Michael's on either Sunday or Monday of this week because I saw it was running low, and I wanted to get a couple of these. We've got you know, Rosh Hashanah. We've got you know, both the beginning and the end of Sukkot. We're going to these first. I wanted to get several. And uh, the line in Michael's was just going to the back of the store. I said, I can't do this. But I saw they weren't on sale in Michael's. They were about $9. So I said, while I'm standing on line for a little, I said, let me check Amazon. Sure enough, I saw them on Amazon for about $7, so it was less than it was at Michael's, and that included free shipping because we have Prime. So I ordered three of them, and they arrived just a day or two later. Now, when I was shaking the box right away, I said there was a problem. They weren't packed well. So of the three that arrived in the box, one of them was shattered. Okay, so I go online. Amazon's got a great return and refund policy. So I click on the refund, and I explain that one of them was shattered, and I'd like a refund on the one that was shattered, they email me back that they're going to refund me, and uh, that's that. But then I look, the refund was for all three candles. So that was for a total of something like $26 after tax. And I, I tried emailing them back saying, no, two of the three arrived intact. It was just one that was broken. I only want a, uh, a, a, a refund for one. I received an email back saying that you can't respond to this email. If you need help with your order, you have to call. So I called to make a long story short. I spoke to the first operator I was on for a while. They said, we have absolutely no way to process this. We don't have anything in our system set up. The refund is set for $26. There's no way to knock it down to seven or $8 uh, and, and, and just refund you for one. 
So I said, no, I wanted to take this opportunity. I always say this, if you're going to do this, make a Kiddush Hashem out of it. So I said, I'm a Bible observing Jew. And our Bible mandates that we live lives of honesty. And I want to make certain that I don't take money that's not ours. And uh, they said, I was still, I don't know what I could do to help you. Let me put you on hold. And I eventually, they dropped the call. Later in the day, I tried again. This time I went on the version online and I said, let me try. They said, we'll have an agent text you and do back and forth. So I'm trying this back and forth and the agent again tells me, uh, thank you for your honesty, but I've, we've never dealt with a case like this. We don't know. It's not even in our system how to handle something like this. You have to get the refund on the whole thing. And I said, again, I'm a Bible observing Jew and I don't want to get a refund on the whole thing. I just want to get a refund for, for, for what I deserve. Nothing more than that. And they said, can we call you? So I said, sure, here's my cell phone number. Eventually they called me, and they got me on, and the person was just really kind of surprised that that's why I was calling to say, you refunded me too much. And it seems like uh, after several tries and getting in touch with the supervisor, he was in fact able to knock it down. So instead of getting the refund for $26 and change, it's now gonna be for about $8 and change. And I kept telling the person on the line, I'm doing this because I'm a Bible observing Jew and I wanna be honest. And at then I told him, I said, I thank you because we're going into our Jewish New Year and I'm going to be able to pray to God and I'm going to say, I did an act of honesty before this, this judgment day. And uh, that's one more merit that I, that I have in my account with, uh, with God. So I, it, was a, it, was a, it was a good experience. And again, I, the, uh, from the, speaking to the operators, it sounds like they don't get these type of calls all that often. And uh, this really kind of shocked them. I encourage everyone, if this ever happens to you, Take the most of this and turn this into an opportunity to Kiddush Hashem and you're buying eternity for giving up on this refund of about 14 or $16. I just bought eternity. I made a Kiddush Hashem. How great is that? I bought a Kiddush Hashem on Amazon. We're all making Jeff Bezos wealthy with purchasing from Amazon. But now I had a chance. Look what Amazon did for me. I bought eternity for $8 or it really was 16. By giving back the $16, I just bought some eternity on Amazon. And I would think everyone, everyone do this. And when you do it, please let them know if it's Amazon, if it's any store, wherever it is, tell them I'm being honest because I'm a Bible observing Jew. Let them walk away from that experience saying that, wow, I dealt with a really honest person today who was Jewish and he was saying he was doing this because he was observing the Bible. Why am I bringing this up? Aside from the fact that it's a great Kiddush Hashem story and these opportunities like this come our way all the time, this really pertains to Rosh Hashanah. On the second day of Rosh Hashanah, we're going to be reading about Akedah Yitzchak. And that plays such a central role in Rosh Hashanah. So much of the davening brings mention of Akedah Yitzchak. In fact, the shofar that we use, we specifically use the shofar of an ayol, the horn of a ram. Why do we use the horn of a ram? So Chazal tell us, use, Hashem says to us, use the shofar of a ram so that I will remember, that'll trigger my memory, so to say, and that I will recall Akedah Yitzchak and you, B'nai Yisrael, will be the beneficiaries. You will enjoy the merits of Akedas Yitzchak anew every year on Rosh Hashanah if you sound the shofar of a ram. I think it's important if we look into the laning that we're going to be reading on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, look what the Torah tells us about that ram. The Torah tells us that after the Malach tells, the angel tells Avram not to shech Yitzchak, it tells instead, there's, he says, leave him alone. And the Pasuk says in Yud Gimel, Vayisah Avram is saying, Av, Avram lifts his eyes, and Vayar v'hinei ayel achar ne'achaz b'sfach b'karnav. He sees that in a bush, in the distance, right there in the bush, there is a ram whose horns are entangled in that bush. And Avram goes forward, and he brings that ram as a korban, as an olah, as a completely burnt sacrifice to Hashem, and that's how this experience ends. One of our great Mepharshim, a great commentary that we showed him, one of the early commentaries on it is the Sepharno. And listen to what he says. On these words in the Pasuk, that the isle, this ram, was tangled up in its horns in the bush, listen to the words of the Sepharno. He says, By the fact that this ram was all tangled up in the bush. And he goes on to say, Avram saw that bush before that, Keda, there was no ram there. There was no way this ram could have escaped from someone's yard and made it there, or some, someone's flock and made it there. This obviously was miraculous that Hashem positioned this ram to show up and find its way here. This obviously was not owned by anybody. It was ownerless. And as Farno says, and through this, Avram was able to discern, Avram was able to understand there was no concern of thievery whatsoever. 
based on how this whole story, how itself played itself out, he saw there was nothing in the bush beforehand. Now suddenly there is. This is not a, a ram that was owned by someone. This was absolutely ownerless. It was miraculous. God guided it to be here in this bush at specifically this moment so Abraham could bring it as a carbon. But again, the words of the Sparna was that now we understood that there was no suspicion of any thievery taking place, that Avram was taking anything that was not rightfully his, something that was owned by someone else. This was something which was absolutely ownerless, so he was able to proceed. What does that imply? That had Avram had any concern that this aisle, that this ram was owned by someone, if there was a chash gezel, if there was a concern of that this was someone else's money, Avram would not have brought this as an Ola. And Avram not brought that as an Ola, think about what would have been different. All of those times in the Musaf in the, that we mentioned, Akedas Yitzchak, all the, all the imagery of the shofar and what that represents, it would all be erased. Why? Avram would say, it's not appropriate. I can't take that aisle. I can't take that ram if it might belong to somebody else and it's not mine. If it's not ownerless, I can't take it. No matter what the zechusa, no matter what the merits might be, it doesn't excuse it. If it's gazel, if it's misappropriated funds, I cannot make use of that. The landing on Rosh Hashanah reminds us that we should never stick our hands onto something which we don't deserve. If there's a chash gazel, if there's any suspicion whatsoever that those funds, that those monies, that the item, that material, whatever it may be, may be someone else's and we do not have rights to it, we should never make use of it for ourselves. We should never misappropriate that. Regardless of what we think we might gain from it, even if it's spiritual, whatever it is, we have no right to take that which does not belong to us. And the ultimate reminder of that is what we're going to be reading on, on Rosh Hashanah. So if we're ever in that opportunity, when we ever find ourselves in that opportunity, that we're tempted to make use of someone else's funds, to keep something which might not honestly be mine, let's remember what Avraham did. Avraham was the epitome of honesty at that moment, at the, at the Akeda, and the only reason he took that ram was because there was no shashkez, there was no suspicion whatsoever that it didn't belong to him. That's why he took it, and now that's why that ram serves in that symbolism and plays that crucial role on Rosh Hashanah that it does. I was reading in a machzer this year, and, and uh, I saw this in a couple places, but I saw it mentioned, in, believe it or not, in the notes in the bottom of the art scroll machzer. If you look at it on Rosh Hashanah night, we have all these symbolic foods that we eat. And we recite a Yehi Ratzon. We recite a very short prayer, a little formula before we eat all those, those foods. And the, the purpose of that prayer is to say, God, I'm eating this food. Now this is going to inspire me to recite this short prayer. May it be your will that the coming year should be ABC. And it's a play usually on a word. It's a, it might be the Hebrew term for what that food is. That's the type of year that we want ahead of us. So I saw in the Moxer that it brings down a note that in parts of Eastern Europe, there was a fascinating custom that people would give their children chicken livers on Rosh Hashanah night. Why? Because how did you say a chicken liver in Yiddish? Well, a beef liver, that was a liver. Liver, that was a big liver. What did you call a chicken liver, which is very small? It was called liberlach, liberlach. And why would they give their children liberlach? Because they would say, that's, like a, that's almost as if saying, lib erlach. We want you in this coming year to have an erlach life. Erlach in Yiddish means to be upright be upstanding, someone who's honest, somebody who's not a cheat whatsoever. Liberlach, rather than asking God with a standard Yiratzon about the type of year I want you, God, to give me, your parents in this Eastern European locale were blessing their children. Liberlach, we're telling you, we're charging you with what we want you to do in this coming year. We want you to live a life of honesty. And that was the parents' prayer for their children on Rosh Hashanah. And that's how they symbolized it, with giving them these little chicken livers, these liverlach, because that would get them to bring up the conversation. This is what we want from you, to live an Erlich life. And I think this is something that all of us could find a way to bring into our lives in this coming year. Let's tell our Kodesh Baruch Hu in this coming year, I want to make a Kiddush Hashem. I want to do my best to exemplify what are the values that you and your Torah what is it that you want for Klal Yisrael? What is it that you want for humanity? What is it that you want us to be an Orla Goyim? You want us to be a light to the nations by being honest and be being upright. And let's find ways in this coming year to really be Erlach, to be upright, to be honest. And when we have that opportunity, let's let the other know, I'm doing this because I'm a Bible-observing Jew. 
I'm a Torah observing Jew, and this is what the Torah asks of us. And that's why I'm doing this. Let's make a Kiddush Hashem. Let's do that. If we commit ourselves in this coming year to look for opportunities to make a Kiddush Hashem, if we commit ourselves this coming year to stay away from anything which may have a scent of gazel, a scent of misappropriated funds, staying away from items and monies which are not ours, will certainly be empowering our tefillos in this, in this Rosh Hashanah. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu answer all of our prayers in this Rosh Hashanah. I know each and every one of us have so much to daven for. May our tefillos, may our prayers be accepted by Hashem. May He bless each and every one of us, our families, Klal Yisrael, the world, with being written, being inscribed in the Sefer Chaim Tovim, in his book of good life, with health, with good health, with recovery for those who need it, with sustenance, and with everything that we're davening for, all that we're praying for in our personal prayers. May all of our tefillos be answered. Leila and I wish each and every one of you a ksiva v'chasima tova, a shana tova mesuka, a sweet new year should be filled with health, happiness and success for each and every one of us. Have a good yantaf, a gemar, a ksiva v'chasim tova, and as we also say, a good gevenched yar. Everyone should have a wonderful, a wonderful and blessed new year. Thank you.